We are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We gather as a community of believers and seekers. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. Many, we are building the beloved community. Come, let us worship together. Refuge, Amy Carroll Webb. How often we seek refuge in this sacred flame from the world's troubles and pain. Today, may our lamp light the way for those who know no refuge, that we may open our minds, our arms, our, our hearts, our mouths to sing, Come, whoever you are, holy new and holy true. Today will be a joyful day, and 
to rejoice and come in. Hey everyone, today's story is adapted from The Real Gift, part of Wonderful Welcome. Nelson's Nana Elsa was going to move in with him and his two dads today. Nelson was worried that it would be too crowded with her there and that he would get tired of having three whole grown-ups telling him what to do. But he also thought Nana Elsa might be worried about moving in too. She might think Nelson and his dads didn't actually want her to live with them. So he made her a special card full of hearts and signed with an I love you to welcome her in. Oh, thank you very much, Nelson, Nana Elsa said. I love this card. I wanted to give you something too, but then I thought it would be better for us to make it together. May I teach you how to crochet? We could make a small blanket together. For two weeks, almost every single day, Nelson sat with Nana Elsa after school, talking and crocheting. Finally, the blanket was finished. Nelson loved that blanket. He took it everywhere with him. But one day, when he wanted to take it to bed with him, he couldn't find it. Soon, the whole family was looking for it, but the crocheted blanket was gone. At bedtime, Nelson was still upset. Nana Elsa sat on his bed and held his hand. Nelson, I hate to see you so sad, she said. But Nana, we made that blanket together. I love it so much and now it's gone, he cried. I know you feel bad, but you know, Nelson, the most important gift was not the blanket, said his grandmother. It was the time we spent making it. You made me so happy when you welcomed me into your home. I wanted to spend special time with you making something, and we did that. The real gift was the time we spent being together. We will always treasure that time and our love for each other and our family. Nelson realized he was glad now that his grandmother lived with him and his dads. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages the lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this miss mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, income equality, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. Our recipient for February is Michigan Liberation whose mission is to end the criminalization of black families and communities of color. They train and develop formerly incarcerated people and their loved ones to lead in advocating for transformation of the criminal legal system. One of their current projects is to grow support for legislative bills to reform our state's cash bail system. Contributions can be made through the website Venmo, username BUCMI, or a check in the mail. However you choose to give, please do so with a heart of gratitude for each other.
We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. We have come to the time in our service set aside for prayer, reflection, and meditation. Each Sunday, we recognize the highs and lows of our lives. Today, we do not have any joys or sorrows that are to be shared. But for those joys and sh sorrows, shared or unshared, know that we hold you in our hearts. Prayer of Hope and Healing, Crystal Hogan. To the God of our understanding, the spirit with whom we commune this morning, we ask that our minds be open, our hearts welcoming, our arms embracing. We lift up those whose lives are touched by sadness, by illness, by worry, and by loneliness. May they find comfort, hope, and healing, and strength in this community and the larger community. We celebrate those whose lives are whole and well. May they share their strength with those in need and find warmth and love in the sharing of their spirit. And let us take a moment to silently reflect in the spirit of prayer. Sing with me. Sing with me. Sing with me. Sing with me, oh my soul. Sing with me. Sing with me. Sing. Speak for me. Speak for me. Speak for me. Speak for me, oh my soul, oh my soul. Oh, speak for me. Speak for me. Speak for me. The New Colossus, Emma Lazarus. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land. Here at our sea-washed sunset, sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name. Mother of exiles, from her beacon hand, 
glow worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command. The air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame, keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. My mom told me a story about growing up as the daughter of immigrants in 1930s and 1940s United States. When her family made an overnight stop on their trip from Detroit to New York City, trips really, her parents would send her into the motor hotel office. My mother, with her Midwestern American English, would have no problem renting a room. The same motels would have told her parents with their heavy Eastern European accents that there were no vacancies. Having white skin, my grandparents did not need to rely on the green book the guidebook that directed African Americans to places to stay. However, they received the lack, the same lack of welcome. So much for hospitality in the hospitality industry. Although unwelcome in many motels, I consider my grandparents lucky. They arrived in the United States before World War I, avoiding war in Europe and the Discriminatory Immigration Act of 1924, which eliminated almost all immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe in favor of accepting immigrants from Northern Europe. Despite Emma Lazarus's words, the US has not and is not always a welcoming place. Not to people trying to immigrate into this country, not to the people who have already immigrated to this country, and not even to certain people who have lived here all their lives. The company where I work uses a Microsoft social network system called Yammer. It is social media for employees. People post all sorts of things. One thread, actually a sub-thread, caught my attention. The thread was on using the term illegals for undocumented immigrants and refugees. The original comment was on a COVID vaccination, was on COVID vaccination, and that thread sometimes gets quite heated. As part of that thread, someone posted a link to a site titled Recommended Vaccines for Immigrants and Refugees. That elicited a response that said, that is good that they recommend the illegals be vaccinated. Note, this person equated immigrants and refugees with entering this country illegally, which I did not see in the original post. A discussion via social media for all employees to see followed. Another person posted that they found the term illegal offensive and responded, the term is immigrant, refugee, migrant, or undocumented non-citizen, also known as humans. Words matter. The term illegals is offensive. The person calling all refugees illegals was unrepentant and continued to post. I'm sticking to entered illegally. They had the option to enter legally. Don't be afraid to offend criminals. This person who assumed all refugees were entering illegally went on to say that his answers, ancestors entered legally, which in his opinion gave him the right to be in this country. He conveniently ignores changing immigration laws or the Native Americans who lived here long before his legal family did. I found myself thinking about this thread. Why does someone refer to people as illegals? One of the people that posted noted that they themselves were often classified as an other, 
so they were offended to hear someone referred to as illegals. This person, rightly I believe, interpreted illegals as being another term for those others, people that one does not have to worry about. At some point, I would guess nearly all of us do something illegal, driving over the speed limit, most likely, taking something that is not ours, or sitting at a lunch counter to force a restaurant to serve all potential customers, not just some. So in a sense, we are all illegals at some point in our life, if the definition of that is doing something illegal. The act can be morally correct, morally neutral, or just wrong. Is entering this country without a visa the worst of the things one could do? In a country that averages a mass shooting every day, I do not believe so. I also think about my ancestors on my father's side, how they entered this country and what kind of welcome they received. Nearly 400 years ago, the Native Americans, already decimated by smallpox and other diseases in New England, were in no position to resist newcomers. Did the British colonists who already lived in New England offer much of a welcome? I don't know, despite my degree in American history but I tend to think they were not being asked for passports and visas. On my mother's side, my ancestors entered the US in the 20th century. As I said, they came early enough that they were able to enter legally, but certainly they had to go through the paperwork to live here. Coming to this country, coming legally to this country did not necessarily translate into being treated well, as my mother could attest from her experiences traveling with her parents. Another example of changing laws in relation to coming to this country is that of kidnapping and forcing people into the United States as unpaid laborers. The welcome slaves received upon entering the US is one they certainly would have preferred to do without. Just as people are sometimes welcomed at our borders and sometimes not, we do not consistently welcome people already within our borders. As much as Unitarian Universalism tries to be welcoming, we also sometimes fail, even within our own denomination. Reverend Carol Thomas Sissel wrote, diverse, multicultural, inclusive, welcoming. If I made a list of every single Unitarian Universalist congregation I have served, visited, or worshiped at, they would have a few th things in common, including the, the use of these words. I love those words. I want what they promise but I have been repeatedly disappointed. It is simply not enough to print them on an order of service or in a newsletter. They must have meaning and intention at their core. In 1993, the organizers of the UUA General Assembly planned a Thomas Jefferson antebellum ball where people were to dress in period costume. It has been a while since that happened, but it has not been forgotten. Reverend Dr. Rebecca Savage wrote, attendees were encouraged to wear period clothes to the ball to celebrate Thomas Jefferson, who attended Unitarian churches. In the spirit, in the spirit of welcome, those who conceived of this social gathering did not take into account the centering of whiteness by asking people to attend in period dress. The organizers forgot or ignored the fact that in Jefferson's time, we black and brown UUs would have been slaves, property to be traded and sold, brutalized and subjected. What would I wear? Would I be allowed? 
to come through the front entrance or directed to the back to enter through the kitchen with the other slaves and servants? Would I allow, would I be allowed to drink from the same punch bowl, eat from the same platters? Would I sit with the other people of color in a separate room or at the back of the gathering? Ouch. I am certain this was not the only time our denomination <clears throat> has had an event that was not welcoming to all. Reverend Sissel wrote that although you, you congregations use the words inclusive and welcoming, she has found the words more often than the actions and has been left disappointed. I would like to believe, I do believe, the person at my company posting about illegals is not a Unitarian Universalist. He is, however, someone who, because of an accident in his birth, has decided he is superior. Whatever his religious beliefs, and lets us know via social media. I do not have that feeling. My having been born in the United States was mostly a lucky act, accident of history. But it was you used that planned the Jefferson Ball, proving what we already knew, that we were not and are not perfect. Welcoming people to a country, to a neighborhood, to a congregation or to a denomination are not exactly the same thing, but they have some similarities. Being inclusive and welcoming should apply to all. Putting ourselves in someone else's shoes applies to all. It could be the shoes of Reverend Sissel when she visits UU congregations the shoes of Dr. Savage at the Jefferson Ball, the shoes of my grandparents who could not rent a motel room, or the shoes of refugees who cannot live safely and find they must leave the country of their birth. Our denomination provides, prides itself on being inclusive and welcoming. Our UUA website says, Welcome to, the, to Unitarian Universalism. We are people of all ages, people of many backgrounds, and people of many beliefs. We are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. We create spirituality and community beyond boundaries, working for more justice and more love in our own lives and in the world. Let's make it true. Worst mistake is giving up, pulling back when you've had too much of not knowing where you belong. The one thing I am certain of is time will change each one of us. For this, you're not on your own. So open your voice and be strong. You are not alone. You are what you believe, you are not alone. You're a part of everything. When life gets you down, set your soul at ease. You are not alone, you're a part of everything. You're a part of everything. 
cheapest secret is the tooth until you finally set it loose. Such an unbelievable game. If you got something to say, then let it out. Give us something to talk about so that you're not on your own. Open your voice and be strong. You are not alone. You are what you believe. You are not alone. You're a part of everything. When life gets you down, set your soul at ease. You are not alone. You're a part of everything. You are not alone. You are what you believe. You are not alone. You're a part of everything. When life gets you down, set your soul at ease. You are not alone. You're a part of. You're a part of everything. You're a part of. You're a part of everything. You're a part of everything. This month, we investigate the fifth principle, which is, in case you forgot, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. And I thought we could have a little bit of fun with this before we start. And so I actually have you up here on my phone. It's very secret. I've been secretly watching you and I definitely saw some of you dancing, so I'm very excited about that. And I brought you up on my screen here so that we can practice voting and practice warming up our right of conscience. So since I can see you, that means I can see you raise your hand or use the reactions if you choose to play along. So in order to get us centered in our right of conscience, first, we're gonna close our eyes and take a deep breath. And imagine and get in touch with that true self at your center, that beautiful bright light of conscience. And now that we have it in our minds, here comes our very first test. The question is pancakes or waffles? Okay, think hard. And when you're ready, my pancake people, raise your hand. All right, I see some I see some hands raised on here. Okay, I'm gonna page over. All right, now waffles, raise your hand. I just want you to know that the vote in the sanctuary is overwhelmingly waffles. And I can't page over quite to see exactly what the count is, but uh, we all know what the true answer is. Okay. Um, all right, let's take it up a notch. If you had to choose a superpower, would it be invisibility or flying? Right, get in touch with that conscience. And let's raise our hand for invisibility. Who's got invisibility? Okay, I got some sneaky people here in the sanctuary and online. I see you. I know who you are, paying attention. And then flying, who wants to do flying? Okay, a couple flyers in here too. Oh, I see someone waving and enthusiasm on here. This is exciting. All right, now that we're really warmed up, this is the hardest one I've got for you. Are hot dogs a sandwich? This is hard. This is really, really tough. Okay. So if you believe that hot dogs are, in fact, a sandwich, raise your hand. Let's see what I got here. No one in the sanctuary thinks it's a sandwich, just for the record, for the people on the Zoom. Although I've got some Zoomers who are like, heck yes, hot dogs are a sandwich. All right, if you're like, Andrea, no, that's crazy. Hot dogs are definitely not a sandwich. Raise your hand. Sanctuary and Zoom overwhelmingly in favor of hot dogs definitely not being a sandwich. Okay, thank you so much for playing along with me. That was just a bit of silliness, but the idea we're exploring here is that we have this innate sense of what we know to be right. And we, as you use, have put at the core of our philosophy the right to practice this democratic process. Bill very beautifully explored about conscience and welcoming in a global way and the way that our American society has grappled with issues of right and wrong, 
of who is welcome and who is not, as well as the ways in which our own Unitarian Universalist communities have grappled, stumbled, and sometimes harmed one another as we've moved to create this vision of community. But now I would like to zoom in a little on our own individual path of growth. I'm the fifth principle. When I think of conscience, I always think of Jiminy Cricket from Pinocchio. My youngins may not have seen this, but it was this little voice that sat on Pinocchio's shoulder reminding him what's right and wrong, the embodiment of the desire to do the right thing. I find that I have a very clear sense of what I think is the right thing. Even in our fun little exercise where the stakes are low, we have a sense of what we know is the right answer. For instance, it's definitely pancakes. Also, a hot dog is a sandwich. There is bread, there is meat. I also have a strong sense that if the world is as I order it, life would be a whole lot easier. I was struck once with something Bell Hooks wrote when she noted that we would never have any peace in the world if we didn't have peace in our homes, in our families, in our spaces that we inhabit with people just like us. And yet, in every church community I have ever been a part of, it is sometimes incredibly difficult to come to agreement. It was my first shock as an adult in church, like Adam and Eve being cast into the Garden of Eden. I had eaten some strange fruit, and I saw some things that I could not unsee. People get fired up about church things. On the UUA website on the fifth principle, they excerpted this reflection from Reverend Parisa Parsa. In our religious lives, the democratic process requires trust and the development of each individual conscience, a belief that such development is possible for each of us, as well as a commitment to cultivate our own conscience. We could call it a commitment to the value of each person. In the words of Theodore Parker, democracy means not I am as good as you are, but you are as good as I am. My connection with the sacred is only as precious as my willingness to acknowledge the same connection in others. That idea is profound and stopped me in my tracks. Not that I am as good as you are, but you are as good as I am. And how good am I? And how good am I at truly valuing people with whom I disagree? This person is not an enemy, but a human, just like me doing their best and sometimes failing at it. There are traps I can get stuck in as I reflect on my own conscience. I can move out of a sense of doing what's right into a sense of self-righteousness and a blink of an eye. I have had to learn through more and more repetition than I like to admit that the best way for me to do the right thing is to stay open and curious to other people to truly value them and their perspective, even when I don't agree, especially when I don't agree. It might baffle me the reasons why someone might not vote the same way I do, but this spiritual principle is asking me to see if I can imagine myself into a space where I could see how the other side might be coming from a place of conscience themselves. Sometimes I have to trick myself into doing this, into finding this humanity. One of my favorite places is actually in the car. There are some people out there, if you can believe it, who have the audacity to get in my way while I am driving. Sometimes they actually can be very irritating. Many years ago, when I was learning to drive, I witnessed a friend of mine stay calm as a saint when another driver was honking at us, and we were just going the speed limit, they were swerving behind us, looking for a place to pass us, and they slammed on the gas to go around us, making sure that we saw that finger blazing in our direction. I was rattled, but she was serene. She just kept driving and said, I just imagine they're about to go in their pants. I was so surprised, I immediately started laughing, somehow imagining every irate driver as an imminent danger of soiling themselves makes enough room for grace to enter. I suggest you try it yourself, it really works. 
Since I can never know what is happening in another person's heart, I have found for my own spiritual practice that imagining myself into their perspective helps me find those points of connection. And out of connection, real sustainable action can occur. This is not to excuse behavior that is clearly against my values, for silence and tolerance can be their own harm, as Bill reflected on. But I find that it's often in places with like-minded people that we still find lots to wrangle over, and it is through listening, curiosity, and openness that we can come to consensus and move closer to that vision of our beloved community. The thing is, I really hate being wrong, even over trivial matters. So I try to make a habit of practicing being wrong. I notice how it feels in my body, the flush of my cheeks, the hot burn of shame in my abdomen, the tightness in my throat. Maybe I got someone's pronouns wrong, or I didn't realize that my good intentions had a negative impact. The right of conscience means that I'm constantly working on understanding what is right and what is wrong. And sometimes that means with new information, I figure out just how wrong I was. When there is wrong in the world, it makes me angry. But anger is a terrible fuel for long-term change. There is a deeper fuel in the quiet, in the listening, in the questions I ask to really try to know what I don't know, to know what knowledge someone else might have. I used to listen only to defend my position. Every word that was said was a new piece of evidence for my rebuttal, as if it was my job to prove to them just how wrong they were, as if the problem was maybe they just didn't know. The fifth principle challenges me to not only know my conscience and express that through the democratic process, but also to invite other perspectives to the conversation. You are just as good as I am. This is not easy, but I believe it is how we move closer to that vision. We are people of all ages, people of many backgrounds and people of many beliefs. We are brave, curious and compassionate thinkers and doers. We create spirituality and communities beyond boundaries, working for more justice and more love in our own lives and in the world. Let's make it true. We're going to sing this as a round the first time we'll sing it all together and then we'll sing it twice through as a round. Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, 
go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. Let it be so. Amen. Blessed be.